I, I think I got into art through my mother. That was my initial, she was, I guess, my first ambassador to art. Um, she was a frustrated artist. She was an English teacher here in the Bronx. She always taught in the South Bronx in different, different schools. So she was a teacher my whole life. Um, she ended up being a guidance counselor or, or moving up to being a guidance counselor before she retired. But she was always a frustrated artist. She wanted to take the test for music and art when she was going to high school, her parents didn't let her. And, she, you know, her influence on me made me want to be an artist before I even really knew what being an artist was. So I always was the kid that drew and doodled and sketched and all of my reports from my teachers was Andre's really smart if he would just focus in his class and stop doodling, stop drawing on, on things. And I always was the kid that had the greatest project. So I did like, I remember in probably like third grade, I had this super dope 57 Chevy that me and my mom made out of paper mache and the whole whole underbody, the whole like structure of it was made out of chicken wire. It's like as a third grader, I couldn't have made that out of chicken wire. It was like, oh, I was already, I was poking holes in my fingers just trying to help her with it. And it was like, but all of my projects were dope because she was dope. And it was like, she wanted to get it in. So, you know, we, that was our bonding thing. We, you know, we made stuff together and all of, you know, all of her friends, all of our family members, whenever they'd give us gifts, I'd get, you know, gift certificates to art stores or I'd get art supplies. And, and so I was, that, I was always that kid, you know, before I knew what it meant to be an artist or even gave much thought to it, I was into it, I was doing it. And then growing up in the Bronx from 77, like, you know, there was, the graph was all around, the trains were painted. It wasn't that I was on the trains by myself or on the trains even with my family that much, but it was around, you know, you'd see the trains passing over, overhead, you know, the four train, my grandmother lived in Melrose Project, so the trip from going from like the West Bronx where I was at, up closer to Cedric and Cedar, to over here by like 138th or 1, 1, 140 something. Anyway, that back and forth, I used to see pieces by like Charlie Ahern. They used to have the sculptures sticking off the buildings, and you know, the, all of just all of the all of the art that was in the street just inspired me, and that 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 kind of aesthetic sticks with me to this day. How did you come to choose these birds? Um, well, my first choice was actually going to be the raven just because I was a big fan of Edgar Allan Poe growing up. Um, that was taken and then the black vulture was taken by my friend Mark Alicia. I, everybody wanted that one. Yeah, just you know, they're, they're, they're cool looking birds. You know? Yeah, it's yeah. A little out of the ordinary. The, the influence of hip hop on me has been immeasurable because I, I mean, past my artwork just in who I am and how I look at the world like that was my first form of culture like that, that was it that was to me it was Bronx culture at that time because I didn't know anybody else was doing it you know like it, it was happening right around where I lived I mean the New York City breakers used to practice up the block for me my brother was close with um one of one of his closest friends was a DJ and he was the DJ for Nice and Smooth. Well, no, he was a DJ for some other local rap group and they used to battle Nice and Smooth DJ for equipment. Like it was that kind of shit back in the days. But it was just, it was always around. And you know, even as little kids, we used to pull out the cardboard and tape it down and try to break. And I was, I was awful, but I, I'd be out there trying to break dance. And we had markers in our pockets and me and my man Tremaine used to ride our bikes trying to get lost, which is like the stupidest shit in the world, but it was like an adventure to us. So we'd ride to where we didn't recognize anything and tag our names up and try to find our way home. Like stupid shit that could have got us killed, but that was that was the energy back then. It was, you know what I'm saying? You wanted to get your name out, you wanted to write your name, whatever, and you just, it was it was everywhere, it was in the air. Well, I, I've gotten a chance to paint a lot of um, baseball greats in general through the 161st Street bid. Uh -huh then they were looking for a Bronx artist to kind of pick up and, and do a few. And it was actually, I was only supposed to do one. And they did a whole survey in the neighborhood to find out who people in the neighborhood wanted to see. And it was one section for Yankee greats and another section for just baseball greats in general. And, you know, I think it's not a surprise that uh, Roberto Clemente ended up at the top of that list. So the first person they had me do was Roberto Clemente. Then after that, I did Satchel Paige and Mickey Mantle. 
And it's crazy because more people in the neighborhood, like I'm talking from little kids, like little kids that would have, you know, ordinarily would have never heard of somebody that played back when Roberto Clemente played, but they knew who Roberto Clemente was immediately. They didn't know who Mickey Mantle was, they didn't know who Satchel Paige was, they didn't know a lot of Bay Ruth or a lot of the other players were, but they knew Roberto Clemente, and that's a testament to, I think, his effect on Latino people, black people, and just his humanitarian efforts. But, um, so I did those players, and then that was all last year, I think in November. Then they came back to me this year to do A-Rod, Joe DiMaggio, Thurman Munson, and uh, actually they had me paint Pope Francis because they were trying to lure him up to the Bronx. There's people that have, that have described you as kind of the third generation of, of, of Chilean uh, songwriters. Mm. You know, Chile has a history, long yeah. history of poetry and telling stories and the mm. people's struggles. How do you feel you fit into that lineage of, of people like Victor Jara and people that, that came before? Well, when, when I'm told this, you know, I, I, I have to take it easy because it's a big giant that you would be stepping on the shoulders of, you know, uh, with a lot of respect and just being completely honest about it and not trying to be who you are not, you know, just being who I am and singing from a place within that I can resonate with honestly, you know, and it is my tradition. I mean, I'm living in Ñuñoa, in Santiago, and this music is in, the, is in the trees, it's in the rocks, it's in the wind, you know, and it's in the protest, and it's in the street, and it's in the universities, and it's in the every night conversation, and my friends are the crew from Intigimani, you know, and then we go and, I don't know, have a beer with Anna, and it's there, it's always there, it's something that you cannot get rid of, you know, so when I make music, of course, I feel it, and I, I, I in my case, you know, there is also an aesthetic direction that is continuing, you know, what was done way back in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, and then out of Chile in the exile, you know, so I take it with, uh, also with humility, but also with pride you know like we we got to do this you know we got to continue with this treasure that we have as Chilean music and take it around the world and also take it deep inside Chile because there is always the risk that it's lost you know for for all the wrong reasons Forward. well it's quite cool that the really the next thing is we go on a tour of tiny villages in Chile like places that have never had bands you know like plugged in mm -hmm. literally like first time thousand people or something like that really small villages this is the next project uh, for a couple of weeks and then touring, touring, touring. We just did the new album, Mil Quinientas Vueltas, which was really welcomed with so much good vibes, you know, here in Chile, everywhere. And so we're going to go playing that music for a long time. And then um, I have a very cool tour in the end of the year uh, in the Patagonia, you know, at, with a boat. A friend of mine and I, we just play duo and we go and play for these communities that are completely isolated, that you can only get there with a the boat. Some, mm -hmm. some places there's only 40 people living there so we go and play for them you know and do the whole route to Cape Horn to all the way in the bottom and then it's the new year who knows you know it's gonna be 10 years since my first album next year so there's gonna be a little bit of that going around and uh, just uh, playing music you know having a good time <laughs> I mean, this is the most multicultural city in the world. So you can give a bit more energy, you know? You are submerging this craziness every day. Get it out, get it out. One more time, we try it. Partiendo sin despedida y escapando de una guerra, cruzaste la cordillera, atravesaste el desierto, o tal vez llegaste al puerto sin saber lo que esperaba. Lo cierto es que atrás quedaba el pasado con su muerto. Tanta 
Tan lejos está tu historia sepultada por el tiempo que no le entrega ni al viento un pedazo de memoria. Nunca buscaste la gloria, imaginaste el futuro, pero en aquel viaje duro que te 